What is up, people of YouTube? Uh, thank you for tuning in. If uh, if there is actually anyone tuning in at this point, uh, I don't know. I can't see anyone. Oh, actually, three people. Three people have tuned in. Four. Tom Hawk. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just want to say um, thanks to thanks to everyone who watched my my last YouTube video, um, which was how to write TV music, which was another production music breakdown. This one's going to be very similar. Another production music breakdown. But focusing on how to write for solo strings. Um, so I'm going to run through, uh, you know, how I write it, how I program it, and how I mix it. So that should give you kind of an idea of, hopefully, how to kind of replicate it in your own way, and do something um, in your own style. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to crack on really. But before I do, I just want to say in the description box, the bio box below this video. Um, there is a composer to orchestrator deliverables checklist PDF, um, which I think would be really useful to the people watching, you guys watching. Um, basically, it runs you through very simple steps, just a one page PDF. It runs you through what you need to deliver to an orchestrator when you're working on a, a live production, whether that be a, a film or a TV show or a game. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's useful. You can grab that in the link below in the description box. Go away and download it. And uh, yeah, let me know if it's useful more than anything. I, I I want some, it'd be great to have some feedback to see whether it's useful. And um, yeah, so without further ado, I think I'll just get started. I mean, just let me know if the if the mic is at the correct volume <laughs> so I don't do this whole, whole stream, um, you know, with the volume, like my was too low. Nobody said anything so far, so I assume everything's okay. If somebody just pops up and says everything's fine, then that would be amazing. Hey folks, hey Rob, hey Tom, hey 222, Johannes, hey. So I, there's someone there, hello above that, I can't see the name. Trevor, Ed, Caleb, awesome. Right, well, let's get going. So I'll just play the track through first uh, and then we'll kind of dive down into more detail I think. So let's go. Thank you. 
So yeah, wow, that's a, a <laughs> kind of rush rush of emotions coming back there. It's an uh, interesting time when I wrote that. Um, so you know, when you when you write this stuff, you you kind of feeling a certain way, and then when you listen back to it, you just you just kind of remember all the things you were feeling at the time. But um, I just want to say a massive shout out to uh, VSL for this amazing synchron piano, um, which I had had the demo at the time, uh, and I haven't still haven't got around to buying it. So that's on the list on the list of things. I mean, I've got a million pianos already, but uh, you can never have too many. Pianos, isn't that right, Johannes? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think the the thing is with something like this track, you know, that that there are a million kind of things you can do with it. I mean, it's just a, a kind of standard emotive track. But I mean, I thought instead of doing the whole big string section vibe thing, I would just make it super intimate. And actually, as you can see. Um, it's not kind of your standard kind of string quartet vibe. It's, you know, uh, we've got two first, two two violins, three violas, and three celli. And actually, this version doesn't have um, Matt Constantine's uh, live celli in it, which was recorded later. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll, I'll kind of run you through. Uh, and just you know feel free to ask any questions obviously the whole point of the live stream is to for you guys to, to engage and, and ask me questions so so please feel free to ask me as many questions as you want and I'll I'll do my best to answer them so I mean I think the thing is with string writing is it's kind of those common misconceptions that you know you can well I, I I guess I guess people think that string writing is just one of those things you can just go like that on the keyboard. You know, you can just put put both your hands down on the keyboard, and and kind of hope for the best. But the thing is, that's just not the way strings work best, really. It's you know, you, you there there have to be kind of as Trevor said in the comments, there have to be kind of lines overlapping. And obviously, that that may not work for every track, but certainly in this one, I'll just highlight all the MIDI. Um, and you can see kind of the way the lines overlap. I mean, I I try and aim as much as I can for something called contrary motion. And what that means is kind of uh, a mixture of lines going ascending and a mixture of other lines kind of descending, if, uh, if that makes sense, trying to explain it in kind of the simplest possible form. So you've always got voices moving away from each other rather than always moving in the same direction, which, you know, just, just adds kind of some <laughs> niceness to the sound uh, for, for lack of a better word um, so if I just kind of solo the string bus you'll you kind of hear the way the voices move so it starts off with the viola and celli together I need to turn the volume up for this So at the moment we've got the viola playing the melody. Then the solo, the, the solo violin comes in, kind of it's taking over. It's kind of a counter melody. So now you've got two kind of melodic ideas going on together, hopefully not kind of interrupting. And I think the key to kind of, uh, you know, maximizing your counter melodies with your melodies is not to have them too much in the same range, because I think that's when it becomes a massive problem. Or if you have two instruments that sound very similar in the same range, like if I had a viola playing that, for instance, I'm not saying it would sound terrible ne necessarily, but I think when you've got kind of two different instruments playing, it uh, it kind of separates them. That's that's kind of the word I'm looking for. It's a, there's there's a there's a degree of separation between the kind of timbre. Um, so 
So you'll see here, you've got the violin kind of dropping down, and even though they are moving in the same direction, you've got this note holding and this note, um, you know, this note dropping. So actually, if I had played it in uh, kind of as both the same note value, both the same rhythm, when I go back and listen to it, I, I might think, oh, actually, I can just chop that in half and then move the second note down, i.e. this note. And just have lines kind of moving. So as you basically, as, as you've got one line holding, you've got one line moving. And if you kind of apply that across the whole string section, that's when you start getting this really kind of nice movement. So, you know, you, you can kind of get, get away with certain voices holding and the other voices moving. I think the key to good string writing is, is voices mo moving around. I think that the common mistake that people make is just with the, the kind of classic ensemble patch where you just shove your hands down and hope for the best. Um, there's no, strings don't really perform like that. And I'm not saying there's no time or place for, um, you know, ensemble patches and just kind of a, a standard chord. Uh, sorry guys, I, I keep forgetting my uh, <laughs> my screen's so wide. Thanks Ed. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about this bit here. So you've got this voice holding, oh, and uh, this voice kind of moving against it. So yeah, I, like I say, I'm not I'm not saying there's no time time or place for just a a chord holding, just chords holding with each other. But I, I would say definitely try and get movement in your in your um, string lines. So. So what I've got going on here between the two celli is one basically just in charge of playing the bass notes. So you can see the bass notes over here. Um, and then one kind of playing a, a top line essentially. And again, you've got this action where you can, one line is holding and one's moving. Just reading the coins now. So yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, Stephen, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I basically play it in. I've got a Behringer BCF, I think it's called BCF 2000. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of perform it in as I'm playing. So obviously you can just do it one hand on the keyboard, one hand on the faders. And then I'll be playing, I'll be moving the um, the fader up and down on, on expression and mod wheel. So to anyone who kind of may not know what those mean, uh, they're CC controllers, so continuous controllers. And basically you're controlling, uh, you're kind of injecting life into the samples by adding realism. So mod wheel is uh, CC1, which is kind of, I like to think of as intensity. It's the intensity of the sound. So for instance, on a violin, the, the bow is pressed harder into the fingerboard, into the strings. And uh, expression is more of a kind of volume. Um, which I know sounds a bit mad because you, you have so many volume controllers. You can control the fader, you can control um, you can control the volume here, you can control the volume in here, uh, here, MIDI volume. So, but basically I would always control the volume here, which is this blue line. So you can see the blue line. I'll just focus on one line for a second. So you'll see that at the moment I've got expression. So, you know, the way you need to kind of think about your strings is almost like a voice in a way, the way it breathes, um, you know. So uh, strings sound super unnatural when I hear people program them and it's it just comes in straight away like a maximum, if they've got like a piano uh, dynamic level in the mod wheel. So a very low CC value. And then suddenly the volume is coming in like miles too high. Uh, it just, it sounds sounds funny to my ears, to be honest. Um, yeah, so try, try and kind of fade things in and out. You see at the start, you'll see at the start, 
the blue line kind of comes in, it's sweeping upwards and then it's kind of moving around. Try and keep that data moving as much as possible. Uh, it should never just be static. If you've got like a, a straight horizontal line, that is a complete no-no. You always want to keep the, the data moving and then obviously here you can see it fading out. And then if I switch over to the mod wheel, you can see it kind of doing a similar thing. Obviously the higher it gets here around 100, the maximum it can go is 127. This is getting pretty intense now. I kind of play this. So it's getting quieter then. Yep. So I get quieter, I get quieter. You know, it's just stuff like that that really helps the dynamics of the track for a start and also it just injects complete believ believability into the samples, hopefully. <laughs> Um, I'm going to have to keep remembering that my screen needs to uh, <laughs> be halfway across. <laughs> so um, yeah, are the, the are the starts quantized afterwards? I actually do. This is people don't do this, but I actually do. So you'll see over here the starts are properly quantized, and I, the reason I do that is because I'm using cinematic. Um, uh, cinematic studio solo strings which are just absolutely fantastic and I'd recommend going out and buying right now if you haven't got them uh, they just sound fantastic super believable and uh, you know it makes programming a real dream because they just they just sound great kind of out of the box um, and basically if you have it on the advanced setting when you play the note it sounds super delayed so the note sounds really delayed so you need to offset that in logic or whatever your door of choice is up here in the delay category. I've got mine set about, I usually have it set about 185, 190 on the legato patches, on these sustain patches. Um, so that, that basically shuffles the sample forwards. So it's, even though it's starting, it's starting there, but because the sample is so slow, it needs to be. It kind of. If I didn't have the delay on, I'd have to have the. I'd have to have everything kind of over like, much further to, like that. And I just hate really messy MIDI. I think that's because I'm an orchestrator, <laughs> so I'm used to getting super messy MIDI, and um, I just prefer to see things on the grid, to be honest. So that's that's the way I like to do it. Um, what else have I got here? I wrote some notes down previously. Um, so yeah, I mean, generally the way I work is I work from the top down. So I know people, I know Junkie XL starts with his melody and then he goes straight to the bass and kind of gets those kind of outer outer lines sorted before the inner stuff. But I actually like to work from the top down. And, you know, if I can see what's going on in the first violin, I'll, I'll often have the notation editor up and um, I'll see what notes it's playing. And then obviously, if you know what the key is, then if you know what the key of the track is, then you can kind of work your way around and see what notes you need to play. For example, I think I'm in C sharp minor here. So if I had C, C sharp, for instance, in the first violin, I might want to play down to the G sharp and then maybe in the viola have an E, so that would make up the C sharp minor chord. Um, so, you know, you want to fill out the chord as much as humanly possible. That's basically the goal here is because some, sometimes it's easy, especially when you're writing with samples, because you, you can't necessarily see, you know, you could pull up the notation editor, but maybe some people don't do that, but it's easy just to kind of end up playing everything in unison and then you just end up with a really thin sounding track. So ideally you need to have the chord filled out as much as possible from top to bottom. And obviously, if you just have a string quartet, you could just fill out the chord, a five note chord across the five, uh, sorry, the four different, four note chord across four different instruments. Obviously, when you're doing something like this, and you can, you know, experiment with having three celli and three violas and stuff like that, you can obviously make the chord sound a lot bigger. Um, obviously, you can't really do Divisi because there's only one player per instrument. The VZ is basically um, 
when you set, set say in say if you had a violin section first violin section if you kind of divide if you had three notes you could divide that across the whole string section so you know that well let's just make it simple so if it was a, a divisi by two they would divide at the desk and a desk is because uh, violins are where strings sit in pairs at a desk like a, a stand so that's why they call it desks um, yeah and and obviously another key to, a key thing to think about is where the instrument is sitting so it, whereabouts in the range the actual instrument is um, that makes a big difference in the sound because often what people do is they write the, the violins up super high and then everything else super low and there's nothing in between which is a common kind of thing as to why things sound thin and kind of um, lifeless really you, you you want to fill out the whole spectrum I like to think of kind of arrangement and orchestration it's kind of like like a mix you want to you want some high end you want some mid range and you want some low generally I mean obviously there are exceptions to that rule but as a matter of thumb as a rule of thumb you really want to spread out from from high to low um, so you know you don't have to have things super high but obviously you want instruments in their best range and a good trick is actually to have if you want something to really stand out if you have something like a celli playing a low string but high up on that low string then it really sounds super intense so the key is to have um, say it's you know play play something on the on the C string on a on a uh, cello and play really high up on that C string and um, yeah go from go from there uh, what other questions? What questions are there? Uh, I, Trevor, I prefer to use separate articulations on separate tracks, uh, just because I find it, um, you know, I find it a bit awkward sometimes with key switches. Um, Cubase, Cubase does that really well because you can use expression maps and Logic have kind of tried to build something in, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, articulation sets I think it's called, but no I just prefer to have everything on a separate channel. Um, that's just the way I like it personally, a lot of people do different things. Um, so yeah, so here's the kind of whole string section MIDI data uh, for the main section and I'll just play that through. You can tell the violins there are sounding super strident. Um, you know, they're, I don't know what they're actually playing here. They're playing in octaves. So that kind of just gives it added punch, really. Have something in octaves, you know, it's a classic John Williams effect if you've got things in octaves. Obviously, you don't need to shove everything in octaves, but certainly it's a nice sound when first and second violins are in octaves. And actually, I've put a. Um, full section first one in there as well just to really fill it out um, and you know you can have things like thirds and thirds and sixths they sound super nice obviously a sixth is just basically an inverted third so say if you had a say if you had um, the second violin playing middle C, you could have the viola playing a sixth below that, major sixth below that, which would be uh, no, actually just a sixth. Just play a sixth below that, and you'd get an E, or you could have E flat if you wanted to. So, yeah, third, sixths, octaves, unisons. Obviously, experiment with what what sounds good to you. But those those are good kind of intervals to have in mind when you're when you're writing. Um, so I'm just trying to read the comments as I think. <laughs> How often do you have separate instruments playing in unison? Uh, 
I try and keep that to a minimum really, unless it's for a kind of color or if I'm doubling for a specific color. Um, I generally kind of keep that to a minimum. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's kind of imperative to get that chord filled out as much as possible. Um, and also you'll notice that the, the melody is kind of spread around the sections. You know, we've got it in the violins, in the viola. I don't know if it goes to the cello at some point. The cello is playing super high up. So where does it go high? So you can see how high that is, that's in the treble, treble clef, look at this, how high this is. Obviously you can't control the string that is played on in, in a sample, um, but you would be able to do that in real life, um, which would add to the intensity. So, and you also need to think about dynamics when something is so high like that, like a cello, um, you know, that that could kind of easily interfere with with a violin if they were in a similar range. You know, if the violin was playing that range as well, the violin would just get completely wiped out because the cello is playing high and it sounds intense. So hopefully that kind of explains the writing process. How about we talk about um, Yasmin? Do you have any tips for the reverb? Yeah, the reverb is quite important. So if I just show you um, kind of what's going on on each channel. So I've actually got Valhalla Room and Valhalla Vintage Verb on each channel. So I've got the mix down to about 30%, 29-30%. And then about three seconds decay. I try and cut out, this is really important, to try and cut the low end as much as possible. So I'm cutting up to 400 hertz. Um, otherwise you just get a really muddy, the reverb just starts getting super muddy um, which you know when you've got this across like 10 different channels it's gonna really build up uh, I've got Kramer tape as well which should probably be at the start of the chain but that's me being lazy um, just to just kind of give some tape warmth really and what's going on with it yeah so I'm doing my usual kind of cutting quite harshly up to up to 230 so usually with something like this I'll listen to it as I'm mixing it back And what I'll do is I'll move this around until I can't hear. I imagine that's pretty quiet for you guys, sorry. But um, what I'll do is I'll move this around until it starts affecting the sound. And then as soon as it feels and sounds right, so in other words, I, I'll kind of let it affect the sound and then dial it back a bit. So that you don't want to be cutting out the body, the main body of the instrument. You should always be cutting your low end out. Otherwise, if you rack this up across, what, you know, 67 tracks, if you leave all the low end in, that is a recipe for everything getting really muddy. So the first thing you should do on every channel, it's the first thing I do when I do a mix, go through <laughs> channel by channel, cutting the low end. And actually, um, on my template, I think I've got a low cut set in the EQ, which kind of just saves time. So you don't have to keep putting a low cut in, it's already on the channel, and then you just move, move the low cut, essentially. To wherever you want it to. Um, so yeah, th th those channels are pretty much all the same. Um, so let's look at the master bus. There's quite a lot on here. Uh, and I like to do very similar things to my strings bus almost every time. So I've got the classic 3 dB, 3 dB boost at 100 hertz on the pole tech. Um, and then just a tiny bit of attenuation. I know you're thinking, what well, he just said to cut. But for some reason in this specific plugin, if you boost at 3 dB, <laughs> honestly, don't ask me why. I don't know why that is the case, but uh, I don't know. It just seems to work quite nicely. And then around 8K, I'm boosting around 4 dB and a tiny bit of attenuation. Um, yeah, just have a play around, folks. That, that just seems to be what works for me. I generally just adjust it slightly differently for each mix. Then I've got the classic SSL G bus compressor, which I have on every mix now. Um, if I just solo the strings again, 
I mean, I know it's adding some volume, but actually, to me, it's adding quite a lot of thickness to my ears. Um, it just kind of helped glue the whole section together. That that's why this plugin is really important. It actually, it does a great job of gluing and gluing all your instruments together, and that is that's important in the mix. So I'm always I'm always shoving that on uh, each kind of group bus. Um, the Marg, Marg EQ, this is another super important plugin that I use. Doing some boosting around five. This air band at the top is just, I, I reach for it basically every time. Uh, every time I do a mix, not just on the strings, on anything really. If I want some high end, for some reason, just that, that air band just sounds really nice to me with around 3 dB of gain. And there's a bit, bit of um, adjustment going on in the mid range, but not much. I'm kind of taking some low end out as well at 40 hertz. Uh, sorry, uh, I think that's the sub going high, 40 hertz. So, um, a tiny bit of stereo image. I rarely use stereo stereo wideners, um, but uh, I just I liked it on this specific mix. And also, a little quick tri uh, trick is to shove decapitator on there. <laughs> I know you're thinking, hold on, distortion on strings, what, why, why is he doing that? But it just, you can always use it like an EQ, like you can see that I've brought out the brightness and maybe you're just listening back on headphones, like I realise I could have done slightly, could have, could, have, could have gone a bit easier on the distortion. So you listen to that, that is a massive effect. And you see how the top ends open, listen to the, the way the top end opens up. When I, when I when I disable oh uh, sorry so the the plugin's off now listen to when it gets enabled so I'm going to enable it two seconds listen to how the top end opens up there so you can use the decapitator from Sound Toys um, as an EQ basically and I'm cutting some lows I'm giving it some drive not much but just just a little bit of drive um, and that just helps kind of push push it out in the mix, it makes it pop a bit. And finally, some classic 7th Heaven, which is one of my favourite reverbs. Um, obviously there are reverbs actually on each individual channel itself, but I I like to do that and then I like to give it a final process with a different reverb on the string, on the actual bus itself. So I've got a bit of a plate reverb, 2.3 seconds, you know, bit of, uh, turn the mix up a bit. Uh, and just really move to choice, I guess. Um, you know, move, move the, uh, <laughs> move the mix until it sounds too much. You'll know when it sounds too much because everything will just sound like a complete wash, wash of sound, and you'll just get no clarity. So uh, it's really important to get this part right. And again, cutting, cutting the low out, probably go up to even 400, maybe even above. Give it a bit pre-delay. Um, and yeah, a lot of this is about personal tastes and personal preference. So you just you really need to just have a play around and with what sounds good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone's got any questions about the mix. I didn't know that. I didn't know that Johan is about the Mog EQ. That's brilliant. Also EQ on the flex bus can help. Yeah, so I generally EQ, as in the last video, I'll EQ out at the low end and then do a, a group process as it were. So I'm always processing, doing the maximum processing EQ wise on on the uh, on the main group channels. And uh, if you don't already group your channels together, like if you're not grouping your strings, you're not grouping your percussion, you're not grouping your pianos, that you definitely need to be doing that because that that really kind of amplifies a mix, you know, getting things grouped together. Not only does it make it easier to navigate around the session, but, um, you know, you can really process sounds and can kind of compact them and glue them all together that way. So group processing is definitely important. So, uh, that's all right, Stephen. Hope it helps. The panning, Charles. Um, so there's actually no panning, I don't think, on here at all. I don't tell like that's the, so the set the section violin, which is Cinematic Studio Strings, which is another fantastic library, is being panned 
20 degrees to the left because the first violins always sit on the left so if you're kind of the conductor on your left will be the first violins slightly right to them the seconds down the center the olas celli on the right and then behind them are the basses now if you want to do the jeff foster classic mix which he he does a lot he will have the first violins left and the second violins right which kind of gives a really nice stereo image um, so yeah there's really no kind of panning going on because that the, the instruments are actually panned within the library itself so they're kind of pre-panned so what you hear say if i was to play this viola line what you'd hear is the viola kind of in the center of the stereo field and then the celli would be to the side so they've been recorded in in orchestral position essentially which saves a lot of time because it means you don't have to pan very much or if I do do any panning it would just be to like properly accentuate certain areas of the mix so if I really want the violins to pop out a bit more I might pan them slightly more left yes the three celli are sat on top of each other correct but I think because of the way I was quite happy because the, the way they're voiced you know there there's quite big gaps in between them especially here over around here so they, they you know they don't get too muddy if you had like massive triads going on in the celli um, you know it would uh, it would begin to get super muddy so you've got to be careful when you're having low instruments you don't want to be having like huge triads you want to have maybe fifths so like a low C and a G that's always a good way to voice it. Say if you had a double bass thrown in there, you could have uh, the double bass playing its lowest note, which would be a C, the lowest C. Then an octave above that, you could have the cello playing a C, and then another cello playing a G divisi. So you've got C and G divisi in the cello, and the low C in the double bass. That's always a good way to voice it. Obviously, we don't have a double bass here, so you can't do that. But yes, Ed, I will play the track through. Do you just want to hear the strings or do you want to hear the whole track? I'll play the strings until somebody tells me otherwise. <laughs> so you want to kind of, you want the strings to breathe like it's almost like a choir, you know. I always try and think of, you know, you want to get the voice leading as natural as possible, so clear voice leading, you know, small steps between notes horizontally, but also good spacing vertically as well as horizontally. So you're filling out the chord horizontally. Oh, sorry guys. Yeah, piano roll. Fill out the chord horizontally, uh, vertically, but smooth voice leading. You'll see the notes. Smooth voice leading from note to note. you'll notice the mo notes are mostly moving stepwise horizontally that's good voice leading rather than massive jumps between notes <laughs> Ooh, bit of Paul Cimento there to add realism low velocity layer here kind of playing almost like an Alberti bass kind of vibe. Now they're starting to get really intense in sound.
a nice tail, a nice rebuild tail at the end. So you can actually see through the MIDI, this is a good arrangement tip, you can actually see visually, just visually, how much thicker it gets as you get further across the timeline. So you'll see, you know, it's not very dense around starting out, but the moment we get into this kind of really emotive section, look at how, look at how much more dense the texture is, and that's how you achieve that big sound. Um, you want to gradually build up the track, so you start kind of very sparse and then adding in layers. It's, it's like, you know, think of it like a pop track if, if you want, you know, you wouldn't start, you wouldn't start um, the verse with massive everything going in. You'll have the guitars kind of chugging away with the chords, with a vocal over the top, a bit of bass, and then suddenly everything opens up stereo pan in the chorus and, uh, you know, just more texture. Um, so yeah, I mean dynamics, voice leading, like I was saying, I don't know if you could hear me earlier, but uh, it's super important to get get the voice leading right horizontally. So you want, like I said, you want small steps between notes next to each other, um, not massive jumps ideally, and then, horiz and then vertically you want to fill out the chord again. So, you know, there's a running theme here, just filling out the chord and smooth voice leading and keeping the voices moving as much as possible. That's what adds um, realism um, and it keeps the string players interested. There's nothing worse than being at a session and, you know, the players just switching off because they've just got what we refer to as footballs, which are just, you know, semi briefs on the, on the sheet music. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of adding interest. And you know, like like I said earlier, don't be afraid to spread the melody around. You don't have, always have to have the, the melody in the first violin. Good orchestration. If you listen to, uh, I don't know, um, John Williams, he's always spreading the melody around the orchestra, literally from bar to bar, and that is that's a good technique. Um, so I, I think I'm coming to the end now. Um, unless there's any more questions. Uh, no, it wasn't written in Sibelius. I played this in. I just build it up. So I start, I would have probably started with that um, viola line there and then added everything around it. And it's just a step-by-step -step process. You you just keep adding things one by one. Um, so that's kind of how you achieve that really. And I, a quick shout out to Alex Roth who did these amazing guitars down here. Really textural guitars, which really add something to the track. So unless anyone's got any more questions, I think I'm gonna wind, wind this up. Uh, did I map out the chords? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't tend to do that actually, I kind of just tend to follow... Like I, I obviously played that piano line in first so I knew what the chords were. And then I'll uh, translate that basically across to the strings. So I, I generally kind of do a piano sketch um, and then I obviously know what chords I'm playing and then I'll gradually start with a melody in the violin uh, or whatever instrument in the viola and then gradually fill the chord out across the section. Uh, with the writing of the entire track, is it fair to assume you came at it with a chord progression in mind? Um, yes, so like I just said, I did the, I, did, I basically did the piano line first, the whole piano um, so that gave me the basis. It's always good to have a basis, even if you don't, even if you you're not even going to use the piano. It's good to have it there so that you know what chords you're playing. I sometimes have a like a notepad that I'll scribble the chords down into. So you know, it's useful to have the chords. Like if I've got a B major chord, I know that I need to use B, D sharp, and F sharp. You know, it's just things like that. It's like I need to have those notes in this chord somewhere across the section. That's all right, Ed. Um, yeah, okay, Rob, thanks for that. That's a good idea. Perfect. All right, thanks a lot for that, guys. I really appreciate you tuning in. <laughs> oh, Keen. I, I thought I was going to get through um, a whole live stream without mentioning Keen, and now I've got to mention Travis. I can't mention Keen without Travis, so. Uh, there we go. Tom Nettleship. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, thanks a lot guys for tuning in and please get in contact if there's anything you want me to cover. Um, I, I want to keep creating good content for you guys, so 
you know, please, please do send me emails. Um, you know, get in touch on social media. I'm always up for a chat with 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 you folks. So, um, yeah, please, please do stay in touch. Um, please, please, please comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, I really want to get this YouTube channel up and properly running and create good content. So, um, yeah, that would really help me out and share it around with your friends if you can. I really hope this was useful and keep asking questions. That's what it's all about and um, it's great to interact with you folks. So, I think I'm going to wrap this up now. I'll play the track through from start to finish with everything in one last time so you can hear hopefully all of that, all of that um, advice kind of uh, all together. Let's go.
well that's it thanks a lot folks um uh hopefully hopefully that was enjoyable and useful um just a quick question from 222 denzi and tom um do you know how the guitars were recorded uh just through some pedals i don't know what pedals they were um you'd have, probably have to talk to alex roth about that because he uh he was kind of dealing with that but um yeah that's that's all i can say really um if you're just tuning in now uh please please uh download my composer to uh orchestrated deliverables checklist pdf which will kind of describe exactly what files you need to send over in a quick and simple pdf um and obviously i should probably mention my my new book notes to notes which is available on my website currently for 9.99 and it describes kind of getting started in the music business and uh, bits on orchestration which will kind of follow on from this really uh, there's some bits about lighting for, for strings um, and things like that so Hopefully that's been enjoyable and uh, yeah, tune in next time folks.